This week's episode of Sounds Good is brought to you by the folks who make my podcast happen, Gradient. They recently launched their full editorial website filled with tons of articles advancing identity and culture. Go check it out at gradient.is. That's gradient.is. Hello, everyone. Brandon Harvey here. Welcome to this week's episode of Sounds Good, the podcast where every single Monday I sit down with an inspiring person and talk about happiness, overcoming struggles, and living a life of intentionality and wonder. This week, I have John Cotton Richmond on the show. After pioneering anti-slavery initiatives in India with the International Justice Mission, John served as a federal prosecutor in the United States Department of Justice's Human Trafficking Prosecution Unit for over a decade. It was here that he investigated and prosecuted labor and sex trafficking cases throughout the United States. He also prosecuted cross burnings, police misconduct, and neo-Nazi hate crime cases. Through his work combating human trafficking, John has earned numerous awards and has served as an expert to the United Nations and the European Union as they too seek to fight human trafficking around the world. He has also trained judges, prosecutors, federal agents, law enforcement officers, NGOs, and international delegations on human trafficking. He recently left the Department of Justice to found the Human Trafficking Institute, which uses proven strategies to stop traffickers, rescue victims, and decimate the prevalence of slavery. Oh, and get this, the head of the FBI's human trafficking program called John Every Trafficker's Worst Nightmare. That's, <laughs> that's nuts. And here's the crazy thing. Though he's probably the foremost expert on the dark world of human trafficking, John is somehow able to continue fighting for justice without becoming jaded or losing hope. And that's why he's on the show today. So this is going to be super good. I want to jump straight into this. So here we go. All right, I am here in the studio in Nashville, Tennessee with John Cotton Richmond. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It is great to be here. This is so fun. I love having you in Nashville. The very first time that you and I met, we met in Seattle. We sure did. And do you remember what we were doing when we met in Seattle? Absolutely. I was in Seattle for uh, speaking at a conference and my son came with me. And you and I met when we went up in a seaplane off Lake Union and got a tour of the Seattle area. It was yeah. absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, I think that's maybe my favorite way that I've ever met somebody is like <laughs> taking a seaplane ride. Um, yeah. It was pretty amazing. That was great. I was very surprised at how smooth of a of a landing you get on a seaplane. I mm-hmm. kind of thought it would be more jolty, but you just kind of, you don't even realize you've landed because you're just bouncing onto the water. That was a really special trip. That was cool. Yeah, and it was great meeting your son. It, you had taken him on basically like a father-son experience, right? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that we've tried to do in our family in terms of just how we manage time is that when I have an opportunity to go somewhere, I try to bring one of my kids with me. And so we've had these amazing adventures. And that week, uh, my son and I got to go through Seattle together and explore and have a great time. That's so cool. I love that you do that. Yeah, it's really fun. It's great. I want to just jump straight into this with like the question that might be on a lot of people's minds. What is human trafficking? Like it's, it's everything that you do with your job. Um, but I feel like that term gets thrown around a lot and there may be a lot of people listening who are like, okay, I've got no idea what that means. Can you break down what is human trafficking? Absolutely. Human trafficking in its essence is forcing someone to work or to engage in a commercial sex act. And it's always about the coercion or the force that requires people to do something. I think a lot of people think that it has something to do with crossing borders, but that's not required. People think that it has something to do with foreigners, um, but a foreign national is not required. U.S. citizens can traffic other U.S. citizens in their own communities. A lot of people think it's only sex trafficking, um, but the vast majority of victims around the world are forced labor victims. Uh, So I think trafficking does bring along a lot of myths um, with it, but the reality is that it is simply forcing or coercing someone to work or engage in a commercial sex act. So that's that's what you do for a job is you you fight human trafficking, which is it, like that's that's a pretty intense job. Um, I want to kind of back up and, and get to know that a little bit. How did you get started in the world of 
justice? Were you always passionate about justice? Were you like, how did you decide that you're going to go into this? You know, I have always been passionate about issues of justice. Um, I wasn't always sure how that would manifest itself. You know, when I was in high school or, or college or even afterwards, wasn't exactly sure what it would look like. But I went to law school and after law school worked for a large law firm doing commercial litigation work and really enjoyed that. Um, after four years, paid off all of my school debt and I realized boom, we could do whatever we want to do. What would we want to do? And at that time, I had visited India a few on a few trips and there was an organization called International Justice Mission that was just beginning to have um, offices around the world. And I was fortunate enough to get hired to go and start uh, their slavery work in India and pioneer and build that office. And India has a huge problem with slavery. I remember it was probably when I was in high school, a friend of mine did this fantastic photography project where they went and they very much humanized these people who are being abused through photography. He showed up in um, what I think was a mine that uh, that a bunch of kids were forced to do forced labor in. And, um, and I remember those photos striking me as like, wow, something needs to be done. And that was like when the flip switched for me where I'm like, okay, human trafficking is a problem and I want to do something about it. And, and so it sounds like you had a similar experience, but actually experiencing India on the ground. And then you, you decided to join up with that organization? I did. I, when we moved to India, I mean, I had never met a slave before. Um, and everyone told me, you know, what does, you know, a white Southern lawyer from Virginia, whose name is John Cotton Richmond, know about <laughs> rescuing slaves? And I started thinking, I don't know anything about it. But I do know this. I know that if we um, apply expertise and skills and energy and effort in a sustained way over time, we can have a big impact. And got to India and slowly began to research the law, uh, talk with um, NGOs that were there on the ground, government officials, and began to meet some slaves and began to meet some traffickers. And then it's how do we bring the justice system to bear on that so that we can stop traffickers from exploiting victims? And so you did that. How long were you in India? How long were you doing that? So we lived in India from 2002 to 2006, just a little over three years. And during that time, uh, grew the office, grew the casework, and built a team that could actually implement that day in and day out. Great, great. And what was your favorite thing to eat in India? I just have to ask. You know, um, there's so many good things to eat in India, but if, um, if the folks in my office were here, they would all tell you it's chicken tikka. Yep, yep. That's my wife and I's favorite thing. I went to India a few years ago and loved it. And that's that's all that I ate the whole time I was there. So good. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, back on track, though. Okay, so from there, you started working for the Department of Justice. Is that right? I did shift to the Department of Justice. The number of people that are doing actual human trafficking cases around the world is actually fairly small. There's a lot of advocacy work. There's a lot of awareness raising, all of which is super important. But the number of folks who are actually working cases on the ground is fairly small. And so I actually got a call from the Department of Justice about uh, the possibility of joining them. They were interested in expanding and building out a human trafficking prosecution unit at, at DOJ. And so we shifted back from India, moved to Washington, D.C., and then um, for the last 10 years have been um, invested in working with federal agents, FBI and Homeland Security agents, identifying cases in the United States, conducting enforcement operations and raids to rescue people. And then I get to know the victims, get to know the traffickers, and we try the cases to juries and try to bring justice. Okay. So you said that you spent time with both the victims and the traffickers. That's, that sounds intense. Like, what's, what's the experience of spending time with those people like? It, it is absolutely intense. And every experience is different because the people are different. You know, I think way too often we sort of stereotype what victims are like or what victims need or how they are going to respond to situations. And the reality is every victim interview is completely different because the victims are different and they respond differently. But uh, many of them have gone through trauma, abuse, rape. Um, some even torture, and working with them in a process of trying to identify what happened to them and helping them learn how to tell the truth that they are reluctant to share takes building rapport. It takes learning how to interview well. Um, it also takes understanding and having empathy, and I think that is what builds that connection. That's fascinating. And then tell me about the other side of that, like you're spending time with the actual traffickers. 
Yeah. Yeah. What, what was that like? You know, one of the most interesting things about my work is that not only do I get to meet victims on a regular basis, but I get to meet traffickers. And I spend a lot of time with them. You know, after we arrest someone, um, they make a decision about whether or not they want to plead guilty and then testify against their co-defendants. And at that phase, I get to spend days with them along with the agents and learn why they got into this, how they went about recruiting folks, who they targeted as victims, how they built their business model, how they made money, how they hid money. And so hearing it from their perspective, seeing it, um, seeing how they think about trafficking has been incredibly helpful in terms of identifying new cases and stopping more traffickers. But it's also given me a sense of their humanity. You know, because not yeah. every trafficker is a monster. Yeah, so, and some I, of them are. And, and my default reaction would be like, oh, no, these are absolutely monsters. Some of them are, and we've put them in jail for life. Some people actually do need to be in a cage forever. And then there are other people who got into it um, as part of a group and just started, started making bad decisions one after the other, and it led to this. But the truth is they're still people, and we want to prosecute them, but we want to do it in a way that protects their rights. But we also want to bring justice to them. Because justice at its core is just making wrong things right, right? It's seeing something wrong in the world and choosing to make it right. Wow. And so the right thing to do is to stop the trafficker from harming the, the victim they're currently exploiting and stop them from, from harming anyone else in the future. But another th- wrong thing that needs to be made right is what's going on in the trafficker's mind. So one way we do that is is preventing them by incarcerating them from harming others. But then there's still work to be done in terms of how do we make sure that the trafficker realizes that neither their best nor worst acts define them, just like neither the best or worst acts that happen to a victim define them. But everyone is responsible for what they do, their consequences, there's accountability, but there's also hope. There's also hope that they too um, can, can be redeemed. And, and these are people who, I've heard you talk about this before, where they're probably coming from difficult backgrounds. Uh, hurt people hurt people is the idea. And so you, I, I guess you're kind of just doing work that's, it's so fascinating to me because you would think that like the government as just something that's f- systematically made to do X, Y, and Z would be like, okay, we will put them in jail when this happens. But you're saying when you showed up and you kind of helped build out this wing of the Justice Department focused on human trafficking, you're like, okay, we're not going to stop there. We're going to actually like impact these people's lives. Yeah. And I want to be clear. Hurt people do hurt people. And none of this excuses what they've done. They still made the decision to exploit others. Um, And lots of people who are abused or harmed never make that decision. So they're still 100% responsible for what they've done. And I think what's important for people to understand is that showing compassion is not consequence free. Like we can be compassionate and there's still consequences. So what we want to do is we want to restrain the trafficker from making bad decisions. But we also want to recognize that there's more nuance to this. Um, There's nuance in the victim's lives. There's nuance in the trafficker's lives. Too often, I think we want to think of the world as white hats and black hats. We're the good guys and they're all the bad guys. And the reality is I think the world has just a lot of gray hats. You know, a lot of victims um, have self-inflicted problems, have done some things that are, are difficult um, in their past, and they should still get justice in spite of that. Uh, we want to make sure that every one of them has a chance to survive and thrive into the future. Um, and we want to hold the traffickers accountable, but we also want to recognize that, um, that they're not all monsters. Yeah. I love what you said about, uh, about black and white versus gray. And I think... I think that's really ultimately the goal for this podcast is that we would be people, that this community of listeners would be people who um, are okay with living in that gray area because the truth is our brains love to compartmentalize things. We love to say, okay, that is black, that is white, that is wrong, that is right. And all too often that ignores the opportunity for us to pay attention to people's stories. That ignores the opportunity, like that dismisses the opportunity for us to actually care about, yeah, to, to just care about things. Yeah. And I think there's two levels to that. So I think there are things that are just clearly wrong and right. Oh, absolutely. So trafficking is completely wrong. People who are doing it must be stopped, must pay the consequences for it. And the survivors must be given the resources they need to, to flourish, to move forward. Um, so those things are black and white, like right and wrong. Behaviors can be black and white, but people 
mm. individuals, identities. That's a different story. The people themselves, they have a chance to progress. They have a chance to reform. They have a chance to reinvent themselves. And we want to make sure that every survivor is given that opportunity. And if a trafficker wants to make that choice, that they might have an opportunity to do that after they've served their sentence. Man, that's good. And it, would you say that that's that that is true justice? Is that is that more than justice? Like what? Like how would you? Well, if justice is making wrong things right, the more people are given the opportunity to become a better version of themselves, we're moving towards right. Dang, that's so fascinating. Man, I can't believe that you're doing this. I can't believe that like that that was your job. Like that's so cool. Okay, so segueing off of this, I remember a story that you told once about the idea of putting labels on people. Kind of, you know, this is along the same lines, but you told the story about your daughter and uh, and her love for Atticus Finch. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think I may have instilled that in her. One of my favorite books is To Kill a Mockingbird. And so I thought the reason to have kids was, there were many reasons to have kids, but one of them was to get a chance to read To Kill a Mockingbird to him. <laughs> yes. Um, and I did, uh, they quickly fell in love with the characters and the story and this idea, again, of what's just, like finding justice within a broken system. Um, and Atticus is such a hero in To Kill a Mockingbird. And then, of course, we heard that Harper Lee had another book, uh, Ghosts of a Watchman. And the reviews of it be- started suggesting that Atticus didn't appear as much as a hero, that there were a lot of flaws in Atticus. My daughter and I were just eating dinner one night at the, with the family at the table. And uh, she said, I'm not sure I want to read the next book because I don't want my image of Atticus to be, uh, to be tarnished. I just began to think about that, like this idea that we want our heroes to be pristine and, and be perfect. But the truth is none of them are perfect, right? You know, our founding fathers weren't perfect. We always hear people talk about that. And about that time, I was reading a new book by a friend called The Justice Calling. And in one of the chapters, it mentions a story about John Newton, who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. And this is a super popular, powerful hymn, has been for years. And the narrative that goes along with that hymn is John Newton was a slave trader, operated a slave ship, had an experience with God, and then reformed his ways, gave up being a slave trader, and wrote Amazing Grace, and the story ends. This sort of very clear conversion and repentance type story. But the truth is, um, he did have a spiritual experience. And on the decks of the slave ship, he wrote Amazing Grace, but he kept buying and selling people and torturing slaves for a decade after no. he, after that. Whoa. It took him several more decades to actually turn against the slave trade and then work with Wilberforce and William Pitt and all the others from the Clapham sect to actually get England to stop the slave trade. In a sense, his story is not pristine. It's not clear. But we began to talk about that and think, is it okay for people to have a longer journey? Most of us are not perfect. Most of us have lots of issues and challenges, but we can still do some good things. And the fact that we've done bad things, we want to be honest about, want to be transparent about, but we also want to give people the freedom to actually make better and better decisions. And I think too often we want to put people up on a pedestal, but we don't want to know who they really are. Mm. I think that the idea that people don't have to be perfect to be good is really, really interesting. And it it kind of gets back into that idea of what's gray and what's black and white. You know, it's you, you kind of want to just like throw the baby out with the bathwater when you find out that somebody did something terrible. But it's like, okay, what's where can we see some nuance in this? Absolutely. And the idea that you don't have to be perfect to be good means that we don't have to lose hope when people fail. Right? When a leader fails, when a, whether it's a politician or someone else, when they have some sort of crime or moral failure or something like that, we don't have to lose our hope. Like if they had done good things before, those other good things are still good. That is, they're good and bad behaviors in life. Uh, but we want to make sure that people know their identity is not exclusively linked to those behaviors. I really think that there's a, a special community of people in the world who really understand that and go full force um, – reminding people that somebody that comes to mind is do you know Jamie Twerkowski mm-hmm, um, sure do Jamie is fantastic but I anytime that I see somebody uh, something happened to a person uh, in pop culture so like recently there was um, a a soccer player for team USA and she got a DUI 
Um, and, you know, this is a fantastic girl, incredible athlete. She makes so much impact in the world through so many things she does. But she also made this terrible mistake. And and I remember Jamie tweeting, almost a reminder, like, this person is not defined by their mistakes. It's unfortunate that this happened, but, like, we don't need to, like, villainize this person. And that's beautiful to me when that happens. Yeah, it, it's essential. Like, I think, you know, the whole hashtag epic fail, like, we are in a culture that often just celebrates people's failures. Their whole website's devoted to it. Their their shows that t- watch everybody fall down and trip and these sorts of things. All of that is just exploiting others' worst moments. Mm. And what would it look like as a culture if when people failed, we're totally honest about it. We don't try to explain it away. We don't try to rationalize it. We don't try to hide it. We're honest about it. But we run to them and not away from them. We run to them and encourage them and help them up. If we actually had a culture that cared for people in the midst of their failures instead of exploiting their failures, laughing at their failures, and just making it a national joke. I think that's exactly what we want. That's perfect. I think that you're really good at being with people. And there's something to be said about being with people in those dark moments because that's when you can actually make an impact. Um, Yeah. We often talk about the power of physical presence. Like It changes things. You cannot love someone well from behind a desk in Washington, D.C. Like It does require Mm. physically relocating myself, and the agents have to physically relocate themselves to go be with the victim in the middle of the stink, in the middle of the mess, and be there with them, Um, as well as be with the traffickers, as well as be in court, just like you said. Um, In that way, it's just incarnational. You have to go be physically present. You know, one of the challenges for me and my family, though, is that there's a cost to travel. There's a cost to removing yourself from one location and going and being with people. It turns out, as as the parent of three, my wife and I have three amazing kids. Um, two are in middle school right now, so we're in the midst of it. Turns out parenting middle schoolers is also <laughs> an incarnational work. It, too, requires physical presence. And so you, there's only so much that we all have to give. Right? Everybody has 168 hours in a week. That's it. It is the great equalizer. And we, we can only be physically present in one place at a time. And so how we choose to use those amazing resources defines us. It tells everybody what our priorities are and what matters most. And so we work really hard um, as a family just to find the right balance in different seasons about how much is too much time uh, traveling away for work, how much is enough time uh, being at home, and how do we how do we join each other in that? How do we stay together through that? And it's just a it's just a great tension that we have to manage. And again, that's not something that it's going to end up being black or white. You can't be like, oh, exactly this many hours is the correct answer. Because at that point, there's, okay, this actually reminds me, if I bring it back, we had an episode with a guy named BC Serna. BC's fantastic, world traveler, mentor. He's great. Uh, but he talks about this idea Well, kind of the same thing where it's like you can't love from a distance. But he also talked about this idea that love requires sacrifice. And you can show somebody that you love them by sacrificing something for them. And so if we made it black and white, if we said, oh, well, John, you can only travel this many hours every week. Then all of a sudden when you're spending time with your kids, you're not loving them because you're not sacrificing for them. And so that tension is, I think, what the beautiful thing is. Absolutely. And we also, as parents, we want to make sure that our kids see us pursuing the great and noble and important things of the world, because that gives them something to hope for. It gives them something to see, this is how I might be engaged one day on this issue or other issues. Um, you know, th- my kids don't want me sitting on the couch all day long. Like, they want me in the game. Uh, but it is something that we have to think through. There's a, a great organization in Atlanta called Wellspring. They have this image of an umbrella, and I love this idea. They use an image of an umbrella to suggest the way two people can share an umbrella is they have to get close. Mm. The only way you can come around someone with an umbrella is to get right next to them, and then that umbrella can shelter both of you. But you can't do it from a distance. Oh, that's good. That's really good. So in Portland, I'm from Portland, and in Portland when people use an umbrella, you're like, oh, that's a tourist. Nobody uses uses umbrellas. It rains every day. Nobody uses an umbrella. Uh, I kind of want to buy an umbrella now just as a, as a little keepsake of that metaphor. That's so <laughs> good. I, I want to get back into this idea of darkness because I think that I think that something I've always admired about you is your ability to stay hopeful and optimistic 
despite the dark, dark world that you work in. And I think that so many of us encounter different gradients of darkness in certain seasons of our lives or in certain roles in our lives or um, things in general. But I feel like you are an expert on this. How do you feel like you are able to focus on goodness and hope in the midst of darkness? Like what, what are some almost strategies or tactics or thought processes you use? You know, it's something I think about a lot, and I think it applies to so many people because there's a lot of darkness in the world. I mean, if we're honest about um, the amount of evil and the amount of suffering and the amount of violence around the world and right here in our own hometowns, um, there's a lot of people who are dealing with abuse or trauma or or just worry and indecision and fear and apathy. There's There's a lot that makes things difficult. The good news, though, is that light is stronger than darkness, right? I mean, light will always dispel darkness. It wins every time. Every time light enters, it defeats darkness. And that gives us hope. I think too often we just feel overwhelmed. And so in in that sense of being overwhelmed, we want to stop. But instead of being overwhelmed, I think we can find great, great encouragement. And the issue of human trafficking provides that because human trafficking can be stopped. It can be stopped as an institution, as something that's legally protected or culturally accepted or religiously endorsed. It can actually end. It has ended. In the United States, human trafficking has ended as a system. And there's still people exploiting other people, individuals hurting others. And we want to stop. They want to be vigilant against that. Um, And we've got great people at the FBI and Homeland Security and Department of Justice doing that. And we want to encourage them to continue. But there are other parts of the world where trafficking is exploding. And it is culturally accepted and religiously endorsed and institutionally protected. And so the question is, can we stop that? And the answer, I think, is yes. And that brings us hope. It is really hard to consistently draw near to pain if you don't think you can do anything about it. And the reality is, I think we can do something about it. And you saw that firsthand in India more than anywhere else. Is that right? You know, I've gotten a chance to see it all over the world, certainly during my years in India, but I've gotten to travel to Malaysia and Oman and Africa, South America. Been all, I've gotten to be all over. Um, and in each place, I find traffickers using the same basic business models to exploit others. And the reality is, right now in the developing world, a trafficker is more likely to get struck by lightning than prosecuted for openly owning a slave. Wow. In a sense, they can just operate with impunity. And if that's the case, why wouldn't they traffic, right? If, why wouldn't they just continue to maximize their profits? But if we could actually change the calculus, if we could actually go in and begin to arrest and prosecute the traffickers and protect the victims and provide them stabilization, we can change it because human trafficking is at its core an economic crime at least from the trafficker's perspective. I mean, when you and I think about it, we think about a violation of human rights. We think it's a fundamental right of people to be free. But for traffickers, it's all about the money. And that means that most traffickers are rational actors. If we can increase the cost of them doing business by prosecuting them, things can change. And that's the secret sauce. That's what what actually can change the system when it becomes too expensive for a trafficker to operate because now they're worried about their freedom being abridged by going to jail. Man, that's, and I I keep on using the word fascinating, but that is so fascinating. And that's, that 100% makes sense to me. And that seems like that's what your new role is. So you you transitioned out of the Justice Department. Um, Can you talk a little bit about that transition and what you're doing now? Absolutely. So I was so fortunate to be a part of an amazing community at the Department of Justice for over 10 years. Um, And this February, I stepped down from that position to really take the lessons I learned um, in India as well as at DOJ and now apply them globally. And so when we think about human trafficking, the vast majority of our efforts fall into one of two buckets. Like on one side, it goes into awareness raising, prevention efforts, trying to make people generally less vulnerable to traffickers. Um, and that's really important work. It's poverty alleviation work, and it, it's certainly important. It should be increased and funded. But it doesn't change the model of the traffickers because there's, with 4 billion people living on less than $2 a day, there's sort of this endless sea of vulnerability. And then on the other side of the equation, there's money that goes to care for survivors trauma-informed counseling, shelters, uh, wraparound services, employment opportunities for survivors so they can thrive into their new freedom. And it's super important. We need to fund that as well. And that needs to increase. But that also doesn't change 
the business model of the trafficker. Last summer, I was talking to a trafficker in Louisiana. He was getting ready to testify against his co-defendants, and he asked me, are the girls in a shelter? And I said, I'm not telling you where the <laughs> girls are. And he kind of laughed and said, I think it's so funny that you're putting them in shelters. It, what he was saying is that you guys are just cleaning up my mess. He said, I'm done with those girls. I've been done with them for a while. I've moved on to exploiting other people. He was viewing human beings as a commodity and a fungible commodity at that. He doesn't care about the names and the faces of the people he's making money off of. He just wants to make his money. And so what we learned is that no matter how important and how aggressive we go at prevention, and no matter how good our survivor services are, if we don't stop traffickers from finding more people, exploiting them, victimizing them, then they're just going to keep making more and more victims that need our improving survivor services. So we have to stop it at its heart. So what mm. we want to do is be a part of that movement, be a part of people coming together and working with governments in excellence, like bringing the expertise to bear to actually help several countries form specialized investigative and prosecutorial units and fast track courts, and then take those members of those units through an academy experience where they actually learn how to do their job. 85% of the police in India, the World Bank said, have never been trained in criminal investigations. And then embed international experts inside those specialized units who have actually done cases before and work day in and day out with them, co-located, not in an office across town. Yeah. And then do that year after year after year and see some change because we know that longevity and consistency matters. Most of our international aid, most of our development efforts last for the grant cycle of 12 or 24 months. And that's just not how real measurable change is likely to happen. Um, and so we're excited about this idea that if by improving the criminal justice response while still bolstering the prevention efforts and the, and the survivor care, we can actually work in collaboration with others to decimate the prevalence of trafficking in several countries and then argue to um, major international policy bodies and international funders that they too could take up this mantle and hopefully in the next generation or two, we can actually end systematic human trafficking around the world. That's incredible. So basically, you started this new thing to do this. Is that right? Because you were doing this kind of consulting before. It wasn't to scale enough. And so you're just like jumping in like, is it like, how do you feel? You started a new thing and it's you're going to change the world through it. What does that feel like? Well, I just want to back up. Say, one thing <laughs> is, I don't know if we're going to change the world or not. You know, so a friend just told me recently, they go, you're just trying to save the world. And I was like, no, my job's not to save the world. My job's to love the world, mm. right? I'm going to leave. a great perspective to have. We're going to leave all the big metrics to, to others. But we want to do our part. We want to bring excellent work and experience to bear in this specific space. It feels great. I got to tell you, <laughs> I've been dreaming about this a long time with a good friend of mine, Victor Boutros. And Victor was a prosecutor with me at the Department of Justice. And he and I have launched out in this together. He is brilliant and smart and and just a really close friend whom I have a lot of respect for. And so doing it with a friend, doing it in community is really um, life-giving. In terms of the entrepreneurial aspect of it, a lot of that feels very much like when uh, we were pioneering the work originally in India. It felt like we were building the airplane as we flew it. And even within DOJ, so many interesting and new reforms were made during my 10 years there as we built out the program uh, here in the United States. Uh, and now we get to do that again, just on a different scale. And really excited about the movement, excited about the opportunity, and excited about this idea of what would it look like if things changed. So the most conservative estimate out there is there's 20 million slaves in the world. That's the most conservative estimate out there. Crazy. The International Labor Organization estimated 20.9 million victims in the world, which is more today than at any point in human history. Um, there were 12 million traffic during the 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade, and we got 20 million just today. That's about the population of Australia. So what animates me is this question, what would it look like if things changed? What would it look like if 20 million people were unleashed from their traffickers? What would it look like if 20 million people were freed up to live out their own callings and creative identities to build businesses, write books, sing songs, make families, like have a life. What, how would the world change if we un, unleashed all of that potential energy? And I feel like that's the perfect answer to that question earlier about 
how are you able to work in the darkness? And you said, you know, I, I see where things are going. I see the hope. And, and that seems like that's the hope that one day there would be no slaves. There would be nobody who's being trafficked. And those people would get to do like they they would just be a part of the world and they would get to do these things that they were created to do. I think that's right. At least, you know, there may still be individuals exploiting others that we need to be vigilant against, but this is a system that can stop. The other thing that I think allows us to draw close to people in pain and hurting, um, in addition to the fact that we have hope that it can be fixed, is this sense that it's not about me. It's not all on my shoulders. I think far too many people that are involved in, in a significant issue or cause easily fall into the trap of taking all the weight on their shoulders. They get kind of a savior complex where they care more than anyone else. Their organization's theory of change is the only one that really makes sense. If they can't take a vacation day because if they do, someone's still suffering in the world. And it becomes this sort of toxic, unlivable burden. Yeah. That's not what it's about. The reality is, is that we are actors in this, but it's not our burden and responsibility. Like, justice is a calling that we're all supposed to move towards, uh, but we don't have to bear the entire weight of it. We can trust that others are doing it too, and that um, we get to participate. Yeah. Okay. And with that, I want to ask, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who are like, dang it, like human trafficking sucks. Like this is awful. What can I do about it? Well, maybe I can go to India. Uh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll become a lawyer, but like the, the truth is that we can't all just hop on a plane to India and be a part of a raid. We can't all go and work for the justice department. Um, what can somebody do practically today that, uh, they can be, yeah, where they can be another actor in the world of justice? Well, I've got a couple thoughts about that. One is definitely not everyone should go to India. They've already got a lot of people, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it, that, that's not the need. But some perhaps should. You know, so the first thought is we need phenomenal people to decide to take up careers as psychiatrists, as FBI agents, as lawyers and prosecutors. So one thing that people could do when they're thinking about how could I get involved is go become awesome. Go get the skills and the degrees and the credentials and the experiences necessary to be on the front lines of this. And do that with a purpose. You know, a lot of people just become lawyers. A lot of people become doctors or psychiatrists, but they don't do that with a purpose of, I'm going to bring justice in the world. And do that with excellence. So it's not Mm. enough just to say, I've got a lot of passion, so I'm going to go to law school. Go actually be an amazing lawyer. Be a really, really good one. Because what victims around the world need are not average. They need awesome, right? They need people to come and bring their very best. And I think way too often, we think that passion alone is sufficient, but it has to be passion plus skill. That's what is going to equal change. And so we need both of those. We don't just need skilled people. They have to have passion, but we also don't just need passionate people. They need to marry that with skill. And then I would say, um, like, certainly not everyone is going to be on the front lines of an issue like this. But, you know, the tip of a spear um, has a lot of room behind it. There's a shaft. There's all these other parts <laughs> of the spear. People need to be aware of it. They need to fund things. They need to um, help raise awareness. And they need to make sure that people can be in this fight long term. But I'd also just say we want to cultivate a culture of justice. If justice is making wrong things right, there are plenty of wrong things all over our communities that we can begin to write. We can make wrong things right in terms of the number of kids that are waiting for adoption in every state in the union in foster care and compare that to the number of empty extra bedrooms that exist in just a few communities. Like we have plenty of resources. All those kids should be able to find a home. Like we can make wrong things right. Not the right decision for every single family, certainly, but it's the right decision for a bunch. There are wrong things that can be made right in terms of middle school lunch tables, right? How people interact, like that kid that gets left out can be reached out to and cared for. Wrong things can be made right in our own streets, in our neighborhoods about how people are interacting with their neighbors or that person down the street that gets neglected or someone who is elderly and and missing their children. Um, There's a way to right wrongs. And I think what we want to do is build a culture where what becomes normative 
is doing that right thing, of doing the next right thing to love the people around us. And as we do that, I think we'll see justice spread, and it'll also reach to the ends of the earth in terms of trafficking. Do you think that it's obvious to know what justice is in the moment? Um, Do you feel like it's easy to know what pursuing justice looks like when it's right in front of you? Or like, does it smack you across the face or is it a little bit more subtle? I think sometimes it smacks us across the face. And other times, I think it is more subtle. Like, it sort of depends. You know, when, when I go home, the right thing for me to do is to love my wife. You know, what I do each night in terms of how to love her and how to understand and listen and care for her um, may change. But the right thing is always to love, right? The right thing is always to to care for my kids and, and speak truth and love to them. You know, I think some of us, though, just feel like, you know, if only I could have been alive at a different time in history. If I were in a position where I was standing up against Hitler or if I were marching with King across the Edmund Pettus Bridge or if I were with Gandhi in South Africa or in India, um, you know, I would have made the right choice. Then there were these epic moments of right versus wrong. And if only I could have stood then, it would have been awesome. But today... It's hard to tell. Like, there's no great issue of the day. And the truth is, those moments didn't seem epic while they were happening. Right? I think they seem epic in retrospect. We have moments every day where we get to make those same choices. And I think what made those heroes great, um, even though, of course, they weren't perfect, right? (laughs) Because you don't have to be perfect to be good. Um, But what made those great is they were making the simple choice in the day without knowing what the outcome was going to be. No guarantees, right? No guarantee of of ultimate success. It's just, I'm going to do right today. And so the question is, in our lives today, as we look at the next hour that we're going to spend or the next couple of hours, the events that are before us, what is something that is wrong that I could make right? What is something that is there I could make better? How could I bring more wholeness to this next event? And just start making those small choices one at a time, step by step. And I think we'll see a pattern develop a pattern that is more just. John, that was, yeah, I feel like this is the perfect time. That was just so good. Um, Every single guest that I have on the show, I ask three questions. And so I want to transition into that. The first question I normally ask is, how do you describe the kind of person you most admire in the world? Um, But I want to ask it in a little bit of a different way for you. Um, In the process of doing your job, you've met all kinds of people that I have no doubt that plenty of other people in the world will never get to spend time with. Um, Is, is there maybe a story of a person whose life has impacted yours in a profound way? Um, Or, you know, that, that you've learned something from that, you know, I would never get to experience. There are several folks um, that I got to meet in India that had a huge impact on me and their stories all shared a similar arc. And that is they moved away from safety and comfort, and they were brave and courageous to do the next right thing. And it cost them dearly. And as as they made those decisions, it was so powerful and so clear. Because I think we so often, we want safety and security. You know, brave and courageous sounds good, but like that's costly and expensive. That's going to move us out of safety and security. And so we don't pursue it. But we expect the same result. We expect that we want justice to be done or issues to be solved, but they're just not going to do it. And one of, the th- one of the traits that I've really appreciated in people is when they're willing to take that risk to go be brave, to go be courageous in the pursuit of the right thing. And what it always costs them is safety and security. Okay. So break this down for me though, because I recently got married um, I'm very like relationship driven. I've got a number of like close people in my life, friends and families and me taking a risk. It could have negative consequences, you know, like is how, how do you justify this balance between like taking a risk for great things, but also like putting relationships first? Like, I, like, I don't know. Does that, does that scare you? Well, I would look at it just a little bit differently. I don't think it's balancing taking a risk versus not taking a risk. I would suggest to you that you're taking risks all the time. Everything you do is a risk. Um, And not doing things is even a risk. So what if you looked at it this way? If there was something important and worthwhile to do that required a risk, then not doing it, 
also contains a risk. Mm. The risk is it doesn't happen. The yeah. right thing doesn't get done. So how do we measure that? If me moving to India was risk, and it certainly was. I mean, our family and friends were, you know, thought we were committing career suicide and that you know we weren't going to be successful, all these sorts of things. You're risking things. But the reality is not going risks things as well. Not going risks the chance for all of the families that found freedom through the work that the office that I got to be a part of did may not have, have found that freedom. You know, the risk of not doing something, counting the cost of something not happening is incredibly important. I'll just tell you that um, tomorrow is a very important day in our family. Um, tomorrow is the birthday of a woman named Mary Ellen. And Mary Ellen grew up uh, in uh, the early part of the 19th century. She wanted to become a doctor, and everyone told her that girls don't become doctors. And she was discouraged by that. She didn't listen to him, though. She went to medical school anyway and graduated with a medical degree from Johns Hopkins University. Really fancy, right? Really yeah, impressive. Yeah. So then she's supposed to do a residency, but she got tuberculosis, and she had to go to a sanitarium for two years. So she still wanted to study, so she just studied her issue, issues of the lung, hmm. paid attention to that. Um, and then she noticed that there was an epidemic of a lot of babies that are being born um, in respiratory distress. They're born early, and then they die. I'll bring the story around, I promise, okay? Um, she noticed that a lot of babies born early were dying of respiratory distress. And so she figured out the solution. She figured out how to save all those kids' lives. And she wrote a whole bunch of scholarly papers about it, but, but no one was listening to her. So finally, a doctor in Japan tried her solution. And guess what? It worked. <laughs> it totally worked and, like, saved the baby's life. So now, now, a few months before Jackie Kennedy buried her husband after he was assassinated, she buried a son. There was a little baby that was born four months before JFK was killed, and he was born six weeks early and died with the best medical care that was out there because no one was listening to Dr. Mary Ellen Avery. So now I'll tell you, um, five years ago, we had a little boy, and he was born six weeks early, and he had the exact same problem as President Kennedy's son. And because Mary Ellen Avery didn't listen to all of those people, he was able to get this thing called surfactant, which allowed his lungs to operate and allowed him to live, right? So when I think about what is the cost of not doing something, think about this. What would be the cost if Mary Ellen Avery didn't fight through gender discrimination, didn't fight through her disease, didn't fight through everybody not listening to her? and didn't come up with this way to save kids' lives. She got a presidential medal for medicine. I don't even know what the name of it is, but she's credited with saving a million babies' lives. The cost of her not following her insight would be a million dead kids, including my son, right? So tomorrow night, we're gonna celebrate the birthday of Dr. Melia, oh, Mary Ellen Avery, right? I we love have that. cake planned and everything. Like, because our kid, my boy is alive today because she followed her passion overcame those hurdles and did the right thing. She, she took a risk. She made justice happen. Wrong things, kids dying, was made right. That's justice. And I think so often we get caught up in life's hard. I've been discriminated against. I've been abused. Uh, no one's listening to me. I don't have the right options. I don't have the right platform. I can't make a difference. But the truth is if we can push through that, take the right risks, do it with excellence, we can actually be a part of something great. You know, Dr. Avery died before my son was born, um, but I wish that I'd been able to take him up there for her to meet him and just mm. thank her personally. Yeah. Because um, there's not many times you can look and say, that one person has changed my family's world. That's so powerful. She took a risk. Yeah. Come over for dinner tomorrow night. You can have a piece of cake. I would love that. <laughs> I would love that. You know what's amazing is there are – I've told that story to people over the years, and they all come back and say the same thing. Several people are like, I'm an Avery baby too. Like I'm one of the huh. kids that had that problem and got surfactant, and my life was spared. Man, I'm going to start asking people like, hey, were you born six weeks early? <laughs> Just so I can tell that story. That's so good. I want to ask, norm, like my, normally my next question is, what are you consuming right now? Like what kind of book, movie, TV show, whatever. But I want to ask specifically, like if somebody wants to, you know, follow their passions in this way and create justice in the world, what's something that you'd recommend to them? Whether it's a book or a, a film, something that would, that'll spur them forward. I would encourage them not to see Taken. 
<laughs> right? Because, I mean, I think too many people th- see Taken and they think that's what trafficking looks like. And it's just such a bad representation. It's a great movie. Um, for years, I would go to conferences and people would say, John, is it like Taken? And I'd be like, I uh, haven't seen it yet. And they would look at me like, how can you not see Taken? Like you do human trafficking cases. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I don't go home on the weekends and watch movies about trafficking after yeah. ra- spending all week hearing about rape, trauma, and abuse. Um, um, but the truth is, I watch Taken on a Plane, and it turns out Liam Neeson is this amazing guy with a very particularized set of skills. And he <laughs> you know, has a beautiful daughter from Orange County, California, who gets abducted while in Europe studying foreign languages. And this European crime boss abducts her and tries to sell her at a slave auction for half a million dollars. That's not what cases look like. Right? It's just not. If it was, I would so do that case. Right? I want that case. But the truth is, cases look a lot different than that. And I think uh, some of the media representations out there about trafficking do a lot of harm in perpetuating myths. And those myths prevent us from identifying where victims exist. You know, when it comes to, to media to consume, though, and, or books to read, there are a couple that come to mind. Um, there is a new book that came out last year by Gary Haugen and Victor Boutros called The Locust Effect. Yeah. Um, excellent book. Uh, and uh, Victor, obviously, is a close friend of mine, as is Gary. He used to be my boss. Uh, there's a, a wonderful new book out called The Justice Calling. There are um, – I enjoy the books that Kevin Bales has written in terms of um, disposable people had a huge impact on me. Um, I thought that book was a, a great addition. You know, hands down, anything that Anne Gallagher writes, uh, she's a, an amazing academic from Australia. Uh, she has written a lot of scholarly work on trafficking and is, is very well respected. There are lots of NGOs who are putting out books. Um, Many of them are helpful and good. Um, But I think there is a need for more scholarship, for better writing, for Hmm. more – for more information about this to get out in the world. And so maybe there's some people out there that could take up that mantle and and begin to – and begin to provide greater resources. That's great. That's perfect. My last question for you, and I love to ask this to everybody, um, it's – Based on the ways you've chosen to step out and live your life differently, what's one thing you'd encourage someone else to do in their own life today? Just one simple thing. I would tell them to stop waiting. Like the thing to do is stop waiting and go for it. Go for something. Just pick something that is meaningful, something that is right, even if it's something simple or something obvious, and just move in that direction. I think far too often everyone is waiting for some sort of engraved invitation to get out into the world and compete in the arena of ideas. And those invitations rarely come. Go out there and contend for your story. Contend for your life. Uh, We like to say in our family, go happen to your life. Go make something happen. Like Be intentional about doing the thing that you're called to, whether it's you want to plant an amazing garden or you want, to, um, you want to start a new project or write a book or you want to start a cause or you want to go invent a new machine. Like, go move in that direction. Great things happen from momentum and movement. It's very hard to, to do something significant from a dead stop. Oh, totally. And if you're at a dead stop, you're like, okay, this is what I want to do. You'll kind of figure out like as you move forward, okay, maybe what I want to do is a little bit different. And I know that's true for me. You know, I always thought I want to be the best photographer in the world. And I started down the kind of the career of photography and I realized, oh, that's not actually what I'm passionate about. Far more passionate about telling stories. And I was like, okay, I'll tell stories through photography. Now I'm telling stories through Snapchat and a podcast, like all these goofy, silly things. My kids think that is so cool. (laughs) I am honored. Um, I would also say that we've got to liberate ourselves from this idea that we're supposed to have it all together, that we're supposed to know our 10-year plan. Oh, absolutely. I I, so often, and I think it is a good goal-setting exercise to say, like, what are your goals for the next 10 years? There's real value in that. But the truth is, nobody knows what they're going to do in 10 years. If you had asked me 10 years ago what I'd be doing, I would have guessed I was living on the wrong continent with the wrong number of children working for the wrong employer. (laughs) I mean, I would have gotten a few things right. I still love my wife. We're still together. But the reality is that nobody knows what they're going to do in 10 years. We can be freed up from this idea that we have to have a button-down path altogether. Because the truth is, if someone does have it all, if they really know their path, nobody likes that guy. That guy is so annoying at a party, right? The guy who says, I'm going to go do this, and then this year I'm going to do that, and goes all the way through. And nobody believes that he's actually going to do it. Because we all know that our lives only make sense 
when we view it in retrospect. Ooh. Man, John, that is so good. Quit waiting, move forward, and our lives only make sense in retrospect. That's perfect. And failure is an option. Yeah. But success is too. Um, but we guarantee ourselves failure by not starting. <sighs> so we might as well give success an opportunity. That's so good. John, if people want to follow you around the internet or if people want to find out more about what you do, how can they do that? So I, I have an account on the Twitter. Uh, it's at John Richmond one same I, for Instagram. I love your Twitter. I love that I get to follow you and, and you'll be like, oh, this raid happened in this day and six people were freed. You're updating things like that. And I'm like, I like, I've legitimately fist pumped before. I've been like, yeah, <laughs> justice. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's, awesome. that's great. That's so encouraging. Yeah, so I I'm on I do the Twitter and Instagram, and then um, there's a Facebook page as well, John Cotton Richmond. Um, they're welcome to follow along, and I'd love to follow them and keep up with all the great things that they're going to be doing. Well, John, I am so glad that we got to have you on the show. Um, you were mentioning earlier that you are our first gray-haired guest, and so for that, I thank you. <laughs> they're not all gray, but a yeah. song. <laughs> <laughs> you got a few of them. Um, man, this has been so good. Uh Yeah, thanks for being on Sounds Good. Hey, thank you. This is awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Sounds Good with Brandon Harvey is part of the Gradient Podcast Network and is created in collaboration between me, Brandon Harvey, and Gradient. Find them on Facebook and Twitter at at gradient.is. That's gradient, D-O-T-I-S. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode. If you enjoyed the conversation, I'd be so honored if you left a review on iTunes. It really, 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 truly helps people find the show. And if you want to keep up with my upcoming travels and adventures, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook at at Brandon Harvey. That's Brandon with an E N. And you can learn more about me and sign up for my good newsletter at brandonharvey.com. And that's it for this week's podcast. See you next week when we get the opportunity to learn from another incredible person. Sound good?